Well, thank you for so much for having us today. Um, I, my name is Peter Nagel. I'm a patent attorney at Brownstein Hyatt Harbor and Shrek. And with me are uh, my colleagues, Andrew Fryer and David Hale. And we are excited to have this opportunity to talk to you about um, uh, intellectual property protection and data privacy fundamentals. Uh, we're very excited to have this opportunity to present to you guys. It's a really unique event and we're thrilled to be a part of it. Um, what we want to accomplish today is twofold. First, we're going to start with a broad, high level overview of the various schemes that exist for protecting intellectual property. Um, and this being a data focused event, we'll also discuss how these various protection schemes can be used to protect various different aspects of data and uses of data, um, applications that use or gather data, things of that nature. Um, as coders and entrepreneurs, we hope this is sort of general interest. Um, and even if it's not directly applicable to the GoCode event, uh, at least helpful to you in your careers sort of outside of this. Um, and then second, we'll pass the presentation over to David, who will discuss the current state of play with respect to data privacy, uh, the risks associated with the use of personal data in the modern technolo uh, technological environment, um, and leverage his expertise on, uh, on big data in general. Um, with that, we will start out and discuss some IP protection schemes. So we'll be focusing today on the four main schemes for, uh, for protecting intellectual property in the US and pretty much most foreign jurisdictions. Um, these are patent, trademark, trade secret, and copyright. So each of these plays a role in protecting intellectual property, um, but they all kind of protect different things, protect things a little bit differently and, and have different um, benefits and drawbacks for, for, um, for the the business owner or the, the whoever is trying to protect the intellectual property here. So um, as you'll see with respect to data and protecting the use of data, gathering of data, things of that nature, all of these except maybe trademark have a, have a role to play in, in getting the protection that you are afforded. Um, okay, so for patents, what is a patent? A pat uh, patent is a monopoly in exchange for public disclosure. Um, basically what that means is uh, you're going to get, if you come up with an invention, you're going to get 20 years uh, of a monopoly, exclusive rights to that invention. Uh, you can sue other people um, within that 20 year period and prevent them from doing what it is that you created. Um, the exchange for that is that you are disclosing your invention to the public. You're going to write it in your patent application that will be published in public knowledge. And then uh, ultimately, after 20 years, you give it to the public. It becomes um, you know, the public domain and anybody can use it. So uh, it's an incentive to bring your, your technological advancements uh, to the public you know, you, uh, in exchange for your blood, sweat, and tears and, and startup money. Um, you get 20 years of exclusivity. Um, and then uh, in exchange for that, you are giving that up ultimately to the public. Um, so the uh, one sort of odd part about patents, they're considered exclusionary rights, which means uh, you can exclude others, you can sue them for doing what you invented. Um, there's sort of a nuanced aspect here uh, in the patent law, um, but just because you have a patent, say on uh, some sort of application, doesn't mean that using that application won't infringe other people's patents. So just something to note, um, uh, probably beyond the scope of this presentation, but uh, just because you own a patent on something doesn't mean that you might not also infringe somebody else's patent. Um, moving on to what is patentable. So uh, the sort of saying is anything under the sun made by man is patentable. Uh, I've never found that to be particularly useful. Uh, there are some categories though that we can rely on to kind of point out what, what we can patent and what we can't. So um, probably the most important for this audience and for this uh, this type of um, event is the uh, processes. You can patent a process. So this can be a, a method of doing something, a method of making something, or uh, computer implemented methods. So this is where you can patent software. Um, there are some current trends in the law with respect to the patentability of software. Um, we'll touch on these briefly later, but in general, um, this is one of the strongest and main avenues of protecting a, a software-based invention is, is the patent. 
Um, you could get some other protections via copyrights and trade secrets and things, but um, generally patents are, are one of the more powerful. Um, other things that are patentable, uh, just these are pretty self-explanatory machines, devices, apparatuses that do things, compositions of matter, probably pharmaceuticals, main uh, point there, and then articles of manufacture. This is just kind of everything else that's man-made, man-made physical object. Uh, my favorite example is silly putty. It's not a machine or a device, but it is something that you could get a patent on. Um, all right, trademarks. This is, I think, one of the more fun types of IP protection, even though I am a patent attorney. Um, they are the things that we're probably most familiar with from a day-to-day -day basis. We encounter them, logos, brand names, uh, product names, things of that nature. Um, the key for trademarks is that they are source identifying. So the whole point is that you can tell who made your product or services or product or service. Um, so when you pick up a can of Coke, you know that it came from the Coca-Cola company and not just anybody out there, right? You could imagine um, things would get a little hectic if, if you never knew who made your product. And when you get those Amazon uh, knockoffs and they have the right label on them, but you know it's not from the, that source, it can be a little uh, problematic. So um, that gets into the benefits for the consumers, right? You know who's behind it, you know who made it, you can trust uh, or you develop trust in, in these brands and these organizations, um, and you know who it is by their trademarks. Um, the benefits for the trademark owner is that it helps you own your goodwill and your reputation. So you work hard to, you know, to make a, a good product and uh, you want people to associate uh, or you want to own that, that goodwill. People you know, know when they love Coke and um, you don't want other people coming on and, and sort of cashing in on your good reputation. Um, trade secrets are another great one for data here. This is um, basically you can protect anything that you keep secret and gives you a competitive advantage. So uh, you do have to sort of take efforts to maintain your secrecy, right? You have to keep it a secret. It uh, can't just be sort of something you leave lying around um, or exposed to the public in a, in a um, careless manner. But if you take efforts to maintain its secrecy, uh, then you can actually keep it secret forever. And that's one of the upsides to this is that you get indefinite protection. Unlike a patent that expires after 20 years, if you're good at keeping something secret and it's the type of thing that you can keep secret, uh, this is a very powerful protection. Um, the sort of canonical example here is the recipe for Coca-Cola. They keep it on lockdown. Um, you know, you, you can't access it and they get to kind of own it forever and, and nobody else can, um, can, can has access to it, right? So um, and if somebody did steal it, you could sue them. The limitations, uh, independent creation is a defense. So if you can reverse engineer the recipe for Coke, then uh, nothing is stopping you from doing that and Coke can't come back and sue you. Uh, if you, you know, clever in the kitchen with sugar and corn syrup, um, you know, maybe you can, you can nail the Coca-Cola recipe. Um, the sort of uh, extension of that, however, is that you can't put the cat in the bag once a trade secret is out in the public, um, it's pretty much out. So if Pepsi reverse engineers the recipe for Coke, puts it on their website, then you're kind of out of luck. So that's really the, the balance um, between patents and trademarks comes in this sort of indefinite protection versus um, uh, sort of a brittle protection where once, once it's out, it's out. Whereas uh, in a patent, you get longer protection, but um, or excuse me, you get a shorter protection, but uh, it is, it's sort of more complete and you own it entirely for that 20 years, uh, regardless of, of what people do and if they start stealing your, your ideas. Um, and the last one here, copyright. So this one is uh, another great one for, for computer applications, we'll say, and its relationship to data is, is one of the more interesting ones with a little more nuance. Um, so what is copyright? It is, uh, it, will, it will protect, pardon me, uh, original expression fixed in a tangible media, which is books, movies, sort of the things you think about, TV, paintings, um, artistic and literary works uh, are gen generally the, um, the main examples of copyrightable materials. 
Um, additionally, source code. Source code is considered a literary work under the US Copyright Act. So you do have a copyright in your source code. Um, and the limitations here is that it only protects against copying. So you think physical, actual copying, source copying uh, source code files on a computer, uh, photocopying a book page, you know, literal actual copying, not just the idea. So independent again, or sort of clean room creation is a defense. Um, if I wanted to make a competitor to Facebook, I could code Facebook from scratch from a blank page. And if I did that, uh, Facebook could not sue me for copyright infringement, assuming I did no actual copying. They could probably still sue me on uh, dozens and dozens of patents, but it would not be a copyrightable or, a, or a, um, an action under copyright. Um, so the, the, again, that sort of gets to the, the difference in the, the cost benefit for uh, copyrights versus patents is that patenting will protect your idea. Facebook can protect the idea of Facebook or any of their sort of uh, more specific offerings, uh, whereas the copyright protection is in the actual code itself um, and not the idea, but the actual, the actual lines of code that have been created. Uh, so that's a, a high level view of the sort of the big four types of IP protection. And now I will hand it off to Andrew Fryer to talk about um, some of the more data centric applications of, of issues and surrounding these. And before I do, I'll just point out um, from the next slide here, we are trademarks don't really apply uh, in the context of protecting data or the use of data. Um, so we'll focus really on patents, the trade secrets, and the copyrights from here on out. Andrew? Thank you very much, Peter. It was a great introduction. And usually when we have an introduction like that, the first question is, well, what does this mean for me? What, what can I take from these different intellectual property domains? How can I leverage those to protect my companies, my ideas, or the work product that I create as I am starting a company or bootstrapping a startup? Um, and so the next couple of slides, we're going to go over uh, different techniques or different uh, issue spotting that will help, uh, hopefully will help uh, folks in positions like yours to decide uh, by and between which intellectual property domains are appropriate to pursue in order to protect um, data centric software startups or data centric uh, inventive concepts. And so to, uh, as a transition directly from what Peter just said, trademarks don't necessarily help here uh, much at all, in large part because trademarks protect brand identity and uh, product source origin. And we're talking about today the actual functional relationships between data algorithms and the outputs of those. So what we're going to be talking about here are concrete examples and use cases in the patent system, the trade secret system, and the copyright system. So we'll start with patents. Top byline is that generally speaking, you cannot patent data. And I mean data itself. So values in a table are not going to be subject to patent protection. Um, and the reason for that is a simple one. It's a policy decision by the patent office. Anyone can gather data and put it into a table. And so by putting certain data into a table, you haven't done anything inventive. Um, it's a gross oversimplification, but that's generally the point. You can, however, Pursue patent protection for ways of acquiring data, ways of formatting data, perhaps ways of transiting data from one module to another, or extracting data from one API or providing it uh, to another uh, service or microservice. We can provide protection using the patent system for how data is encrypted or decrypted, how keys are shared in order to facilitate encryption or decryption. We can also provide protection for how data is manipulated. So for example, in the MLAI context, we can provide protection for the uh, manipulation of input data sets used to train a particular machine learning model or the outputs from that tr already trained machine learning model. Or in the context of an MLAI implementation that doesn't require training, how that black box system actually works on input data to provide output data. Um, now, that's, that's a lot of scattered examples, and so the, uh, we'll try to make this a bit more concrete. Generally speaking, the way that the Patent Office is looking at software inventions and data manipulation inventions is through the lens of a technical problem that is solved with a technical solution. 
Another different way of phrasing that is, can somebody else just do this with pen and paper in their head? Is this just the operation of mathematics? If that's the case, then you're not going to be patent eligible for this particular idea. But if we can articulate a solution and a problem in the technical sphere, then it is likely that the patent office will consider that particular software invention or data manipulation invention to be one that is eligible for uh, patent protection. And so really we try as patent attorneys to focus on articulating inventions as technical solutions to technical problems. Another way of lensing that is whether or not your software product can improve the function of a computer or improve the function of a network. So a good example there is if you develop a more efficient algorithm, fewer processor cycles will be needed to provide the same output. That improves the operation of the computer. If you invent a more efficient way of communicating data across a network, bandwidth utilization goes down, maybe memory uh, utilization goes down or processor utilization goes down. All of those things will improve the operation of that architecture. And that's a different way that we can lens software inventions. So even if your company is uniquely focused on data, and even if your idea is uniquely focused on taking particular data from one of the uh, GoCode databases and providing an interesting output, we can reframe the way that that data processing pipeline operates into either the technical problem, technical solution lensing, or the improvement of the operation of a computer lensing. The point is there are many different ways that we can provide patent protection to things beyond just the data itself. In the trade secret context, like Peter mentioned earlier, a trade secret is only so good as it can maintain its secrecy. Now in the software space, especially for SaaS platforms or uh, client server platforms where most of the data is going to be protected behind a firewall or behind some uh, serviceable API, the uh, trade secret domain is a good way to protect or provide protection over your data itself and your databases and your tables and your data architecture. Uh, but as David, I'm sure, is going to talk about later today, that's only good at, insofar as you maintain industry standard uh, data protection policies. If you have an exposed database or your database is enumerable by, uh, by an end user, you're not going to be able to lean on trade secret protection because you haven't exercised any ability to actually keep this data secret. So in order to leverage trade secret, we do need to maintain industry standard data protections, uh, which could be everything from firewalls to user uh, authentication, um, to making sure that your data is encrypted so that if it is, if your database is leaked or enumerated, um, that the data itself is not exposed. Point being, if you want to leverage uh, trade secrets, you have to keep it secret. And then finally, copyright. In the software space, as Peter mentioned, this means uh, the actual copying of source code. Now that doesn't mean that somebody gets access to your repository or that they, uh, they need to exactly duplicate your, uh, you know, your, your JavaScript libraries or whatever that you're serving to client devices to, um, to, to provide data to your users. What this also means is that if a competitor of yours tries to decompile uh, one of your executables or tries to scrape your website in order to find more information about your company. Copyright law can provide protection against those types of actions as well. Copyright exists in two different uh, domains. We didn't mention this earlier, but there are automatic copyright protections that happen. Um, the moment that you begin typing in a particular source file, you have gained copyright protection over what you have typed into that file. Um, Additional protections uh, can be made if you register your copyright with the Federal Copyright Office. Um, and I'm sure the next question will be, well, why would I distribute my code, uh, my code base to the Federal Copyright Office? Um, you do get protections for that, but you can also submit redacted uh, sections. So there is, uh, there's no need to completely expose your entire code base in order to leverage registered copyright protections that may be available uh, to your company or to your idea. So from a copyright perspective, the, uh, the, the best protection comes from the source code level. Um, good examples with respect to data itself is uh, whether or not you have added something to the data that causes it to be different 
than just a mere aggregation of existing data points. So, for example, a dictionary. A dictionary is one where you have to add creativity to actually define the words. If I copy directly from the Oxford English Dictionary, the, uh, the text of every single definition in the Oxford English Dictionary, I have very likely committed copyright infringement over the owners of the Oxford English Dictionary. That said, if I duplicate the data that is in a phone book, which is just names, addresses, and telephone numbers, in all likelihood, I haven't uh, uh, committed copyright infringement because there's no sort of creative expression there. There's nothing additional that the owners of that uh, phone book or the producers of that phone book uh, added. They simply aggregated the data together. Um, so that's a really high level uh, reintroduction to the concepts of, of patent trade secret and copyright as they apply specifically to data centric and software centric uh, startups. But there's a lot more um, to discuss today. And uh, to start that conversation, I'm gonna pass the ball over to my colleague, David. Thank you. So <clears throat> the, the final area of um, data protection or, or uh, intellectual pro property-like protection that we're gonna talk about is a little bit of a shift, <clears throat> excuse me. And that's to talk about personal data, uh, data privacy. Um, the idea of privacy has really kind of shifted over the years and in some senses is changing rapidly and accelerating. So um, let's start with a little bit of history. Um, the first generation of privacy laws in, the, in the, anything like the modern era really thought of privacy as um, a, a, a protection against intrusion. So you have the Fourth Amendment. Uh, which was you know, part of the original constitution, which keeps the government out of your house unless it has a really good reason. Um, that's a very, very rough uh, way of thinking about it. And then you have privacy torts. Um, that's things like um, the right of publicity or uh, the right to sue someone who, in, 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 there's a tort called intrusion upon seclusion, right? Which is where you invaded someone's space, essentially. Um, or private fact disclosure, which is where you've You've revealed something about them that might be true, but is generally not considered to be um, something that people would, would publicly talk about. And these were Victorian era torts um, that really came about from this combination of uh, the development of things like cameras, um, and in particular, instamatic cameras, which were ubiquitous. And then also the, 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 the kind of sensibility of uh, propriety that was very popular at the, at, at, at the time. Privacy torts and, and, uh, and the like end up um, being the mainstay of what people were thinking about in privacy until really we have this development in the mid part of the 20th century of large amounts of, of data aggregation. And suddenly there's information about you in different places. So the, the second generation of of privacy laws really swings in in the 90s for the most part, the 1990s. And you have this kind of sectoral approach, right? So just particular sectors of the economy or another way of thinking about it is kind of dangerous data. So it, this is a little bit of an, ex, of an extension of this idea of privacy as an intrusion. It's putting, it's prioritizing, protecting information that is uh, some way uh, potentially scandalous or dangerous. So you have HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which um, it creates this whole set of, of rules for healthcare information. Well, that's kind of you know, creepy. No one really wants uh, the, the public to know that even innocuous uh, health information, right? I, I had a wart taken off my, uh, you know, my hand last year. I don't want that publicized, even if it doesn't really matter, right? And then you have um, things like Bram Leach Bliley. That's the um, uh, the the financial services uh, uh, privacy law. Uh, did a few, the act itself did a few other things, but Title V sets out a a privacy regime for financial information. Well, that's both a combination of Kind of creepy information. You don't really want people to know a public a public access to your uh, personal financial information um, because you don't want people to really understand that. Although that's not a universally held um, social sense, right? In, in for example, Norway, 
um, it is a, 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 the government publishes your salary every year. So it's not necessarily a, um, a, a universal consideration that financial information is, is something that we should be keeping as, as, as private um, and away from, from, from others. Uh, but it's also a, a, a risk, right, in, sen in the sense of the, the information that's protected by Graham Lynch Wiley is the kind of exactly the kind of information that, that the bad guys want to use to try to commit fraud, right? So I can commit identity theft and other forms of fraud if I've got access to uh, your account information from, a, from your bank. Um, it just makes it becomes much more, more easy. Then you have um, rules like the, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act or, or COPPA, which, which deals with data about children, uh, children under 13, FERPA, which is educational uh, information. Um, and you have uh, the FTC here uh, jumping in with really, really um, extreme cases uh, of mishandling of information where it rises to the level where it's an unfair trade practice or a deceptive trade practice under, uh, under the FTC's general trade rules uh, it, it, you know, impacting commerce. Uh, maybe a generation 2.5 or, or, or 2.1 is, is the data protection laws that, that came out from the states uh, in the early 2000s that relate to, uh, to data breach. Uh, California was the leader there. Uh, basically, social security numbers, driver's license numbers, um, uh, 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 account numbers for uh, bank accounts when they're in conjunction with uh, things like passwords. So again, Dangerous, dangerous data, uh, things that could be used for identity theft, for, to commit fraud, et cetera. This is generation two, right? And then in the last really, I, I guess, 10 years is when it's kind of become a, um, a, an, an issue of the, that society has really kind of doubled down on. But really, in, it was in 2016, 2017 that GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, was passed in Europe that creates this comprehensive right to control personal data. That really kind of was a, a shift in the, across the globe in terms of how people were thinking about how do I control the bits, the ones and zeros that relate to me. Uh, shortly thereafter, you have the CCPA in California, the California Consumer Privacy Act, and then Colorado and Virginia last year both, both passed laws. Utah as we're, uh, as we're talking right now, their Consumer Privacy Act just passed both, uh, both their houses, but the governor hasn't signed it. Um, that, may be, that, that may be flipped by the time this actually airs um, you know, for, this, uh, uh, for this program. So let's talk a little bit about um, some general terminology that's kind of come up around um, thinking about privacy. It's, it, we could get into sort of the details and the weeds of all of these laws, but I think it's really helpful to just sort of think about how regulators, I mean, how privacy advocates think about information generally. So some, some important terminology, data subject. Um, uh, Europe uses this term, um, the, uh, Colorado uses this term, um, some other folks, uh, some other uh, laws um, don't use the term, but the idea is still the same, right? This idea of you have to designate the person to whom the information relates. Um, and then you have the idea of processing. That is generally just do stuff to information, is processing information. Uh, two important concepts in, in the EU law and the Colorado law, um, the controller, that's who decides, that's, that's the company that decides what we're going to do with this information versus a processor, which in, in, uh, California also calls a third party or a service provider. So you could have a controller being uh, the company that's been entrusted with, uh, with the information by the data subject, and then it's directing some vendor of its to do something with the information uh, in a particular way, um, whether that's you know, processing it to, to, to transform it or, or to store it or to um, analyze it in various ways. It's very important as a, as a company when you're handling data to understand the difference in terms of who are you? Are you the controller of the information, which gives you certain responsibilities and certain rights? Or are you the processor of the information, which means that you, a lot of those responsibilities are shifted away from you, and yet you, they're replaced by other ones, their duties that, that go to the controller. Um, a couple other really important concepts, 
Uh, sale, California in introduces this idea, this very weird definition of sale. It's very broad and it doesn't really line up with how people normally think of a sale. It's essentially you're giving information to, a, to another party in a way that it doesn't, it doesn't very strictly control how they're using that information. And that may be a sale. In California, you have to give people an opportunity to opt out of that. Um, and then finally, another concept that's, that's becoming very popular as an issue that, that I think is one to be concerned about is the idea of a dark pattern. The reason I think you have to be concerned about this is this is where um, you're, you're pushing the user in one direction or another by using subtle clues in your user interface. The reason that's an issue is that the, the regulators seem to be very concerned about this and are very willing to call things dark patterns when in reality what they are is frankly mistakes. Um, some of this stuff is complicated um, and it's very easy to make a mistake in terms of, of, of a disclosure or the way that you describe something and then have that come back to you as, as an accusation of well you're engaging in a dark pattern when really it's just you messed up. Um, let's talk about some, uh, some, some, some ways to think about data types if you want to move on yeah so again this is not necessarily these are this is somewhat tied to these various statutes but it, this is really more about um, a way to think about personal information these various categories that i've put here are to, to, to very much emphasize they overlap each other right and, and um i think the, the obvious one to start with if you look at the first three right those are clearly overlapping personal information, anything related to a person. Now, when, remember when I was talking about the, the various generations, right? In generation two, we were very concerned with very particular types of information, financial information, social security number, et cetera. And we're in the middle of a bit of a hangover from that, right? People wanna talk about that kind of information as being personal information, but that's really not the case anymore. Now it's anything that relates to an individual. That could be information about, you know, your preferences, right? What color you want to see on the website, um, it, even if that's not identifying, right? It could be uh, metadata about when someone logged in, or um, you know, a photo or a, a, a biometric piece of information. Anything that relates to a person, um, even if it doesn't identify them, and that's distinct from the idea of, of an identifying information or personal identifying. Information or sometimes it's called personal identifiable information. And that's information that identifies the individual either by itself um, or in, in combination with information that, that's other common data, right? So a good example of that is, is um, if you take an address, for example, uh, a physical address, you can often, and often is, is the case that it's broken down in databases into, into, into its component parts, right? Line one, line two, um, city, state, uh, zip code. Well, you take any one of those elements by itself, maybe that doesn't really um, identify an individual, but you put them together and it does, uh, or at least a household. Uh, and so it's, it's a little too cute, right, to say, oh, well, this, this, this um, zip code by itself isn't, um, isn't identifying, so I'm going to call it non-identifying. If it's always in, in conjunction with other information that, that collectively it does in fact identify an individual. So that, and, and then there's other things that are obviously identifiers like social security numbers. Um, what I like to call high risk information, I'm making that a distinction from sensitive information. So high risk information is important to think about because not all information is the same. Identifying information is more sensitive than personal information. High risk information is even higher, right? So you may want to think about the kinds of security controls that you've got in place, access controls that you've got in place for this kind of information, payment card information, driver's license numbers, bank account numbers, social security numbers, um, health information, in fact, um, and then authentication information like, like passwords. Um, sensitive information I'm calling that different, how, that's different from high risk information because it's something that's defined by statute. In particular, it was defined originally by the EU statutes. So it's this European idea of sensitive. What's sensitive? Things like race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, your immigration status, um, 
interestingly, in the EU, your trade union membership or your union membership. Um, California brings about over all, all of those categories. Um, Colorado and Virginia have also brought on for most of those categories, except for the union membership. Um, so this is, it, it, this is kind of an interesting way of thinking about things, right? Because it, you're not um, treating these differently because they pose some additional risk um, in, the, in, the, in the concrete sense, the way that, let's say, a social security number is, that, that if I leak this, it's going to lead to identity theft. But it is a risk if you think about it from kind of a longer term, bigger picture European perspective in that these are the things that people have been discriminated against and frankly, murdered um, for on mass basis, right? And so there's a lot of sensitivity, um, rightfully so in, the, in Europe about, well, what kind of information are you collecting about me? What are you doing with it? And how is it being used when it falls into one of these categories? I think it's also useful to think about separately about authentication information and how it overlaps with some of these other things. So that's obviously things like passwords and one-time codes, but it's also biometric and sometimes geolocation or, or transaction information. So sometimes you may, may call up your bank and they'll say, um, as trying to authenticate who you are, they may say, well, well what was the last transaction you did or, or what's, your, um, what's your bank balance? some of the information that we have access to or that we may come across access to is actually used for authentication. Social security number is sort of the, the poster child for this, right? It was originally created to be an identifier, right? To distinguish me, David Hale, from the David Hale who lives half a mile down the road. But uh, it's now been used, it's been co-opted by various organizations to be um, a, a method of authentication. And that is not necessarily very secure, but you need to think about when you're using information, how else is this information being used? Am I using it? Am I, am I publishing it out? Am I putting it out there or sharing it with, with third parties in ways that's inconsistent with the idea that actually I'm also using it as an authenticator? And then finally, I want to talk about this data type. It's an important concept of anonymous versus pseudonymous. But by the way, pseudonymous is, is one of those words that's a, a shibboleth, right? That if you're a privacy professional, you can say it. And if you're not, you can't. Um, or there's de-identified data, which I think is, you know, legislators prefer because they can't say pseudonymous. Um, anonymous is one way um, that, that essentially it's irreversible, right? Once I've, just, I, I've, I've done whatever I'm doing to my data to make it anonymous, I can't undo it um, in, in any way. No one can undo it. Pseudonymous is similar, right? It's a, say, a one-way hash. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, someone can reverse it, um, reasonably reverse it. Um, and de-identified sort of takes this idea of pseudonymous and then adds on the requirement that you have legal restrictions in terms of making sure that the people that you might share it with aren't able to re-identify the information legally. So let's talk a, a little bit about the kinds of rights that these um, newer laws that have come up in the last five years create. Um, all of these laws, uh, the, the CCPA, GDPR, CPA, uh, CPA being the Colorado law, create this idea of the right to, to, to notice that an individual has. These are rights that the data subject has. I have a right to notice about how you're going to, what information of mine you're going to collect and how you're going to use it. And at least in, in a categorical way, who you're going to share it with. Have a right to data access and portability. The GDPR sort of divides us into two things, right? But really they're kind of the same concept. The right to get my data back from you. And in a way that is, um, uh, that, that data uh, is readable to me. Um, I have a right to rectification. I have a right to correct things that are wrong. And I have a right, a limited right, to delete information or ask you to delete information, or in the in the case of where you can't delete it, to limit your processing, right? to limit what you can do with it. Um, in some cases, you may need to keep something for a period of time because of uh, uh, to protect your legal rights. You may not be able to commit to deleting it, and that would be okay, but you still can't use that information for other purposes like marketing. And then in California and also uh, the, the Colorado, you have this right to limit sharing or sale of this information. Um, and this is tripping a lot of people up, right? You have to have a con uh, some sort of way of people 
coming in and saying, I would like to limit this information, how this information is shared, um, which means you have to have that mechanism right, where somebody actually has a way of, of expressing to, to, to invoke these rights. It's not enough to simply say, I'm behind the scenes or I, I, here's my privacy policy. You have to have some sort of mechanism for people to make these requests. So there's other re requirements that aren't really tied to specific consumers in the, in, the, in the Colorado Act. And that includes things like data impact assessments. So where you, have, uh, where, you, where you are processing information in a way that is potentially harmful to users, you have to, to do an assessment of how that processing, what you're doing, might impact people. Um, you have to have security controls. You have to do due diligence on your vendors. Um, but so this is, this seems like a lot of work, right? And it is a lot of work. Um, it is complicated and it is important, but there is a big, but that's really important for, you know, the, the, uh, go code Colorado, um, projects, right. And that is publicly available information. So the CPA, the Colorado privacy act, um, and CCPA is a similar, Virginia has, have similar provisions in them exclude from the definition of personal information, which if you think about it too much is a little weird, um, exclude publicly available information. Uh, they don't say that that's not, rather than saying it's public, it's personal information, but we're gonna treat it differently. We say it's not personal information, it's kind of weird. Publicly available information is information that you've gotten from the state, right? From any of the governments, federal, state, or local government records, or, that you have a reasonable basis to believe that, that it's been made by public by the consumer. Now, this hasn't been tested, right? None of these laws are really new. Um, the idea, especially the second idea of what does it mean that it's reasonably made available uh, by the public, you know, you know, to the public by an individual, it's a little hard to say. I'm gonna kind of guess here, educated guess here is what this means things like um, well, I found it in the phone book. Okay, that's probably pretty, I mean, that is definitely public. And I think that there's a, uh, uh, it's reasonable to say, you yeah, know, okay, this was intended to be made public because you can, you can opt out of the phone book. Um, but there's some, there's some limits there, right? If it's published, if it's put out there by the, by the state on the website, you know, obviously publicly available, that's going to be publicly available information. There are occasions when you might come into, into contact with data from the government where maybe it doesn't fall into this. And that's where if you're acting as a vendor for the government um, or just generally, if you have to sign an agreement to get access, you know, this is a big blinking red light, right? That wait, let's, we need to figure out what, what rights do we have to this publicly, you know, to this information, even though I'm getting it from the public. So that's kind of a, um, a huge amount of information about personal information crammed into a very, very short period of time. Um, but I'll leave you with some, some additional resources. Um, hopefully, I think this slide deck is going to be available um, separately from, from this presentation. Um, these are the various statutes, the Colorado statute, GDPR, et cetera, along with a couple of great resources. You've got the FTC has some great resources on, on thinking about privacy and security for businesses. And then um, I think that the IAPP is a great organization for folks who are trying to wrap their head around building a real privacy program where you're involved, you know, that, that you need to have when you are dealing with large amounts of, of consumer information. Um, you, before you join, before you hire your first privacy officer, you probably need to paying attention to what the IAPP is, is, uh, is providing as, as free information. Um, I'm a member, they're not, you know, they, they haven't sponsored this or anything, but I think that they're, uh, they're a great organization and encourage people to look into. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Peter to, uh, to close out. And I think, uh, and thank you very much for, for, uh, for listening. Thank you, David. Thank you, Andrew. Really appreciate uh, your thoughts and insights. I uh, wish you best of luck in the competition and uh, hope to hope to hear from you soon. Take care.